Okay. So are we recording? Yeah. Do you have anything you want to announce? Okay. Okay. So, yeah. Marina, how nice to see you. Wow. Yes. Wow, that, 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 that. <laughs> Welcome to the people on Zoom. How nice to see you. There are still Zoom participants, yes. <laughs> I'm wondering if I should okay. Let's see if other people get on. We're recording. Yes. Okay. Eric Tov, welcome to the Bet Midrash Erev. We have people here in Matan. We have people on Zoom. Welcome. And this is a new initiative. We've been studying together for many years on a Tuesday night. But what's new this year is the Bet Midrash Erev in that every Tuesday night at 8:30 there will be an English class. And so you can sign up for Tuesday night and you can go between the two classes. All the classes are um, alternate weeks. So you can make Tuesday night your learning night. Hello, Ellen in New York, how are you? Um, you can make Tuesday night your learning night and uh, right take there will be Tammy's class, my class, and there's also Gemara being offered. There's actually three courses in English being offered um, on Tuesday nights, as well as the fact that for the first two weeks, all the Matan classes are free. So come and try whatever it is that you want. The idea is to encourage people, also on Zoom and also in person, to come and try whatever they want. Hello, Erev Tov, good to see you. Can I just talk? talk We're on the, you're fine. We've just started. Kol Tov. Um, I think I know everybody here, but let's just go around the room. Everyone can introduce themselves. I'm Gina. Hey. Yes, Sharon. This is Estelle. Wonderful. And we have on Zoom, Raina and Ellen. And um, this is Orly, Brianna. And who is this? I know who this is. This is this is Helen. Somebody who doesn't have a name on their screen, but if you want, you can identify yourself or open up. Okay, we are studying this year Jewish women. It's a continuation of the course last year, but again, every shiur stands on its own. Last year, we focused essentially on women from the Torah, right? And we we did many many interesting women. Some more well-known, some less known. Then at the very end of the year, we already moved into Nevi'im, right? And we did um, we did the wife of Manoach, Shimshon's mother, right? And we did Pnina at the very end of the year in the Hana and Pnina story, we did Pnina. Um, now we're going to focus this year on women in the Nevi'im, Ketuvim, and we are going to move into women of the Talmud, and hopefully at the end of the year, also contemporary Jewish women. That's the plan. Today, we're going to look at a very interesting figure, Michal, and I'm calling her for now Michal Bat Shaul, Michal, the daughter of Shaul. I'm not referring to her yet as what? Michal, the wife of David, okay? That will be part two, as you can see, part one. That will be part two. Right now, we are going to focus on Michal Bat Shaul as the daughter of King Saul. I have to say that when I came to Israel and made Aliyah, I think Michal was the most popular girl's name. Like my children in every class, they had at least three Michals, right? There was Michal Agvoa, Michal Nemucha, Michal, you know, I don't want to say Shmena, they didn't say that, right? What? Right, Blondinit, Yafe, Michal Blondinit, right. Um, I think today now the most popular name is Noah. That's right. I think that's true. Um, so today we're going to look at the story of Michal and we're going to look actually at the text in Sefer Shmuel um, as well. Um, I don't want I don't want to spoil. You, afterwards, at the end, will each one, every person is welcome, right, to give their um, opinion as to 
um, how you see this woman portrayed. Again, the purpose of our shiur is not just to study biblical personalities, but rather to take from them, right? What can we learn from them? How can we implement this into our own lives? What, what traits, right, do we want to take? What are things that we want to learn? So the background to our story, as we are in Shmuel Aleph, chapter 17, is this. Goliath challenged the Israelites every morning and every evening for 40 days. Goliath is the, the, the hero of the Philistines, right? In the description in the Navi, right, we would literally call him what? A giant of a man, right? A giant, right? And he stands above everyone else and he has a huge armor. And every day he comes out to the battlefield and he challenges the Israelite army. And the idea, of course, was that instead of the army of the Plishtim and the army of um, Bnei Israel coming out to battle, and this was quite common in the ancient world, each one of us will choose, I guess for a better uh, word, each, each side will choose a champion, right? Each one will choose a champion who represents us. These two will go head to head in battle and the victor, right? Well, then that army is the victorious army. And so Goliath represents the Plishtim and who should represent Am Yisrael? I'm asking, who should represent Am Yisrael? <coughs> the king, the king, the king. A big, strong person. Excellent, both excellent answers. A big, strong person who will be able to stand up against Goliath. Excellent answer. Or perhaps the king. Right? Perhaps the king himself should be the one. So every morning and every evening for 40 days, Goliath comes out to the battlefield and what? Challenges. And no one comes forward. No one is willing to what? To accept the challenge. Nobody. They're afraid, obviously. Um, when the Israelites saw Goliath, they ran away in terror. Look at him, they said to each other, listen to his challenge. King Shaul has promised to give a big reward to the man who kills him, and the king will also give him his daughter to marry and will not require his father's family to pay taxes. Oh, very clever on the part of Shaul Amelech that there are two incentives. One is what will have the princess, right? The king's daughter handed marriage. Again, it sounds like the fairy tales, right? But the prize is the princess and tax free. Right? Taxes free. That's really quite an incentive because when we go back and we read the beginning of Sefer Shmuel, Mishpat HaMelech, one of the arguments is that the king has the ability to what? To tax, right? And to take whatever the king wants. This indeed was supposed to be initiative, right? There will be no taxes paid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man that comes up? Surely to taunt Israel, he has come. And the man who kills him, the king will enrich him with great riches. And he will give him his daughter. And his father's house will be free in Israel. Uh, which is what? What the daughter is abstract? Not paying taxes. I think also from the words in the text, right? bet aviv I understand bet aviv means what? The extended family, correct? Not just you, right? The family now, everyone, right? Doesn't have to pay taxes. Prizes uh, promised to those who emerge victorious in battle are familiar to us from other places. At the beginning of, book, of the book of Shoftim, we are told about Kalev ben Yifune's proposal. And we studied this together last year about Achsa. <coughs> Kalev ben Yifune said, he who smites Kiryat Sefer and takes it to him, I will give Achsa, my daughter, as a wife. And when we learned it, we said, really? I mean, to give your daughter as a prize? There's something here that, but we understand that it was considered what a great thing, right? And here's a great warrior. It seems right because we don't even see it just once. We see it. <coughs> women were currency. Okay. Um, nevertheless, the prize that is promised here appears to be on a grander scale, for it includes an economic component as well as personal status, right? And what's the economic component? No, ha not having to pay taxes, right? 
um, the family, and there will also be family connection to the king. The prize attests to two things. First, it gives expression to Shaul's personal intervention in the matter. It was already noted that it was Shaul who should have gone out to fight Goliath, and he doesn't. The personal prize noted that it was Shaul who should, oh, sorry. Um, the personal prize offered by Shaul emphasizes his personal interest in having someone else do the job in his place. And secondly, the prize illustrates the enormity of Israel's fear to meet Goliath's challenge. First of all, 40 days the challenge is put out and no one comes forward. And then even it seems after the king has offered this tremendous incentive, what? <laughs> it doesn't seem like what? There is a huge line of people, right? In line, wait. What? If you're dead, you can't. This impression is, um, okay. This impression is reinforced by the fact that even this grand prize fails to persuade anyone to accept the task. The time of the meeting between Shaul and David has now arrived. On the one side, there is a frightened king who is looking for someone to accept upon himself a mission that is rightly the king's and who is ready to promise great rewards in exchange. On the other side is a young man who doesn't understand why nobody is going out to fight this uncircumcised plishti and was filled with faith and victory over one who taunts the armies of the living God. And David said to Shaul, David Shaul, Al alav, azeh. Let no man's heart fail within him. Your servant will go and fight this plishti. Now, what do we think of that? First of all, he is quite a young man. Okay, and what are his um, what are his qualifications. qualifications? Thank you. What are his qualifications? He's a shepherd. He's a shepherd. That's what he is. Okay. But he showed up. But he showed up. He's willing. He's willing. Full of bravado, says Alexa. He wasn't part of the army. Okay. He's visiting his brothers. Excellent. So why would he? Uh, why would Shaul accept him? You saying he has nothing to lose? No one else has shown up. It's a joke. The joke is when he comes to the I think this is the scene for Shaul's enmity and resentment. Okay. 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 He's he's this nothing. How does David refer to himself in this pasuk? He sees himself as what? I'm a loyal servant of the king. That's how he sees himself, right? As a matter of fact, in his eyes, right, everyone should have stepped up, volunteered, okay? Now, he doesn't seem to be afraid. He doesn't seem to be, right? Which is, again, quite amazing because no one else has stepped up. You're saying he has faith in God, okay? He does refer, right? Okay. At this point, Shaul rejects David's proposal. And he says then, <laughs> ah, Why can't you win? You, <laughs> you're a little boy. <laughs> you are a lad. Okay. I think, right? There's, there's a bit of criticism here. It's not just his age. It's what? It is his age. But more than that, yes, you're, you're a patient. You have no what? You have no military experience. You are uh, an innocence. Yafe. Maybe even the bravado. Even the way you talk shows how what? How childish you are, right? How you're a kid. Very good. You're a kid. Okay. And then he says, and the other reason why you will not succeed is because Goliath is what? He's a warrior from his youth. He has been trained to fight, right? He is what we call today the ultimate ninja warrior, right? He is the, he is the, he is, the, he is this is what he's been trained to do, right? Who are you that you even think that you step up? Obviously, Shaul did want someone to step up, but he hoped that the person who would step up would have some Military experience. Again, it, reflects on him. it reflects on Shaul. Yes. Okay. Because okay. then the warrior comes forward and he says, "I, you know, I'm instead of the king." It's sort of okay. level playing field. This is an okay. official coming and, and defeating him. Look at David's response. David's response is this: "Vayomal David, Hashem Asher Hatzileni Miad Haari Umiyad Adov, Hu Yatzileni Miad Aplishti Azeh." 
ויאמר שאול לדוד, לך והשם יהיה עמך. To answer Shaul's question or issue with the fact that he is young, what is the answer? Hashem is on my side, right? That's answer number one. Answer number two is what? You say I have no experience? You're mistaken. Let me tell you that when I was a shepherd, I had to defend my sheep against what? Against lions and against bears. It sounds like that children's song, right? Lions and tigers and bears, right? It sounds almost absurd, right? But native to Eretz Israel, there surely are um, lions, like mountain lions, not lions like in the savannah in South Africa, right? But mountain lions, right? Which definitely would attack the sheep. And Ma'anyan, when he says dove, but there is, there is a Dov Suri, now it's extinct from Eretz Israel, but there were, there were bears, um, and surely in certain areas. And he says, I in the past have had to protect my sheep against wild animals. So you think I have no experience, but it's not true, right? And he's also between the lines, essentially comparing Goliath to what? Okay. To wild animals. It's interesting. You see him as a trained warrior, but I see him what? different. And actually, it's fascinating because the technique that David uses against Goliath is what? One that you would use against what? Yeah. An animal that attacked him with his slingshot, right? With his avanim um, chukot, his uh, very smooth, right? Stones. I am fascinated again by the fact that he says, Hashem asher hetzileni. He says, it's not because I am so strong and brave, but because whenever I go out to fight, I truly believe that what? Hashem is helping me and guiding, right? Now, Shaul agrees. Vayama Shaul and David, lech, go. Vashem yem mcha, and may the Lord be with you. Now, we could read, may the Lord be with you in so many different ways, honestly. We could, we could read it with tremendous sincerity. May the Lord be with you. And we could also read it like, oh boy, may the Lord be with you. <laughs> like what? Good luck, right? All I can say to you is what? Hashem yeim ha. That's it, right? Ah, lech, ah, yafek. Vayom HaShol David, lech. Maybe he says, get out of my sight, right? Not go to the battlefield. Excellent, excellent, effect. Goliath starts walking towards David, and David runs quickly towards the Plishti battle line to fight him. And he reaches into his bag and takes out a stone, which he slings at Goliath, right? And he aims it very specifically at what? At his forehead, right? Um, it hits him in the forehead and breaks his skull, and Goliath falls face down on the ground. This is already very interesting, not that I know the physics of it, but we would assume that if someone got hit in the head, they would fall back. He doesn't fall back, he falls forward. He falls forward. Um, and because he is such a large person, right? The fall, the fall, right? Um, renders him at least um, incapacitated, which is what David wants to do. Because what do you have to do? You have to bring your enemy, down so that you can now what have an even playing field and so when Goliath is down on the ground David then takes Goliath's sword cuts off his head and kills him now we didn't learn that part in the Gan Yeladim <laughs> we, no we didn't we learned in the Gan Yeladim that he killed him with the stone but that's not the stone, because of the stone, he falls. And then he takes his, well, it, you're right. We have to look carefully at the psukim. Yeah, Did the, he, he's unconscious. And then he takes his Goliath sword and cuts off his head. Now, there is nothing more humiliating to a great warrior than to be killed by your own sword, right? Even today in Sahal, we know, Al-Torah Haneshek, and you are not allowed to ever laugh, kill et aneshek, right? You have to sleep with it under your pillow, in your sleeping bag at all times. As a matter of fact, the mefakdim, the officers come in in the middle of the night. And what do they attempt to do? 
to take your weapon, right? They attempt to take your weapon. The fact that Goliath is killed with his own sword, right, is a humiliation to the great warrior. David will then keep the sword, right? It will be something that he will keep. It will remind him, right, um, of this victory. And then after the great um, victory against Goliath, you can only imagine that David becomes now what? Grand hero of Israel. Of course, of course, right? The next pair. And David went out. Wherever Shaul would send him, he would succeed. And Shaul appointed him over the soldiers and was pleasing in the eyes of all the people and also in the eyes of Shaul's servants. What happens after the battle of Goliath? David becomes, how many? He becomes what? A, a favorite. He goes up the ranks, right? He now becomes in charge of the army. And whenever there is a problem, Shaul then sends David, right? Now, he doesn't just um, rise up in the ranks of the army and is pleased, uh, pleasing to the soldiers. Also, right? All the people now what? Everybody loves David, right? And be'enei avdei Shaul. Also those who are what? The servants and loyal to the king. And it, and it was when, when David returned from slaying the Philistine. The women came out of all the cities of Israel to sing. And they came out towards King Saul with drums and joy and with cymbals. What is this reminiscent of? The women at the sea, meaning women coming out to rejoice in victory. And they specifically, what? Have instruments and dancing, right? To peem the same way Miriam has her drum. We understand that this is, and it's also like um, to hail the victors as they come, the women come out. I think even people used to go, even in modern days, they used to throw flowers, right, at the army as they came down. Um, and the cheering women sang. Shaul has slain thousands, and David has slain ten thousand. This is the song the women are singing. What is the problem with the song? <laughs> they have made David what? Greater than King Saul. They, th this is the song that the women are singing. And Shaul was very, oh, what a beautiful word in English. Chagrined. Very nice. Chagrined. He's very upset, right? Of course he's upset, right? Um, and and it, the matter displeased him because it seems that what? David is now a favorite of the people instead of the king. They ascribed to David 10,000, and to me they ascribed 1,000. And what more can he have? but the kingdom. This line is very telling. Whether Shaul actually expressed it to other people or whether he just said it to himself, but what is his impression? That if he's become a favorite of the people and the people now love him so much, what? The next thing he'll want to take from me is what? Is the kingdom. He's already taken what? Public opinion, right? Next thing he'll want what? The crown. And Shaul and, and Saul, look at the English, interesting. From the root of the word Ayin, I David from that day on, but there's a Kriuchtiv. It also means Waya Oyen. He he was what? He was weary. He was weary of him from that day forward. But it does fit the root of ayin, because even in English we say, I'm keeping my eye on you, right? It works, right? I'm watching you, essentially. Yes, yes, correct. Shaul doesn't know. Right, correct. You're right, he's already been anointed king, right? Vahimi Maharat. Yes, of course, Yonatan. Yes, yes, yes. 
And it was on the morrow, and it was on the morrow that the evil spirit from God rested upon Shaul, and he raved in the midst of the house, and David was playing with his hand like every day, playing what? What's men again, right? He's playing music, right? And, and the spear was in Shaul's hand. In pre previously, we already found out that, that that Shaul has a problem in that he has often what this ruach Elohim ra'a. Okay. He today you might call it what some type of bipolar. He's depression. Okay, okay. He's suffering from the spirit, which kind of takes him over, and he doesn't seem to be. And he doesn't seem to be in control. He's threatened. He feels threatened. Okay. Yeah. And Shaul cast the spear and said, I shall, the spear and said I shall pin David to the wall. And David turned from before twice. Meaning, and each time he, what? He, he misses, but he nearly kills him, right? And Shaul feared David, for the Lord was with him while he had turned away from Shaul. He feels that Hashem's presence is now what? With David and turned, right? Not with him. And Shaul removed him from being with him and made him, made him for himself a captain over thousands. And he went out and came in before the people. Um, and David was successful in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Verse 13 is very unclear. What do you make of it? <laughs> Who is the him? Who is the him? He tried to send him away, tried to get him killed. He sent him to war. Okay. And David is successful, meaning Shaul wants to send him far away, and perhaps that something should happen to him, but David is successful. Not only that, Hashem is with him. Right. Okay. Um, and Shaul saw that he was very successful, right? And he feared him even more. And all of Israel and Judah loved David. For he went out and came in before them. This expression, we find it in the Torah also with regard to when Moshe Rabbeinu wants to choose a future leader for the Jewish people. He says to Hashem, it has to be someone that can meaning it means to go out to war, but also knows how to what? Bring them back, bring the troops back. Right. Um, and Shaul said to David, Behold my elder daughter, what? Merav, there is an older daughter. Okay? She, I will give her to you as a wife, but be a warrior for me and wage the wars of the Lord. And for Shaul said, Let not my hand be upon him, but let the hands of the Plishtim be upon him. Meaning, let him go out to war and let him be killed, literally, what? By the plishti. That's nice. Okay. I'll give my daughter someone and hopefully become a widow. It's very, very problematic. I agree. I agree. Um, and besides the fact that, was he not promised, what? The king's daughter? I mean, like, that was part of the Goliath story, right? And David said to Shaul, Suddenly he's very what? Very modest, very modest, very surprised. Who am I? What is my life, right? Or my father's family? We are just what? That I should be a son-in-law to the king, right? Is that? You would think he wouldn't be the least bit surprised, right? As this was the prize which was offered to him. He hadn't heard about the prize. I think so much time has passed and nothing has happened that he he didn't even why think that he given why wasn't he given the daughter right away? Maybe because he was a now, because he was young. Okay. 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 Um, 
ויהי בעת כתב מרב בת שאול לדוד, וניתנה לאדריאל המחולתי לאישה, and it was at the time that Rav Shaul's daughter should have been given to David, that she was given to Adriel the Macholait as a wife. So don't be worried. <laughs> what, what actually happens, and this part doesn't make any sense at all. At the same time that they are supposed to be busy arranging the marriage of what? Merav to David. <laughs> what happens? She is married. My, oops. She is married off to somebody else. But it's by the same person, her father. Her father, correct. This didn't happen by someone else, by mistake, and right? Judy David to be off, ah, yeah. Judy says that he expected David to be killed off. He didn't think that he would actually have to arrange that marriage, right? It's interesting because you already are noting that it seems that Shaul is going back on, on his word, right? How can you trust him then if he promises something and then go back goes back? On his word, um, I, I, I'm going to I'm going to give a bit of a spoiler. Is there another biblical story? Is there another biblical story in which there are two sisters, and there is a, a swap, swap, or a switch which occurs? Yeah, I see everyone going like this, right? What's the story? It's Leah and Rachel. Right? There's an older daughter and a younger daughter, and someone who was promised, and what? And a promise which doesn't happen. Who is the one who makes the switch? Who is it? The father, right? It's very interesting that we have such a similar story, right? Um, again, with two sisters and a, yes, Ellen. But don't we even see today in the Shirach world that the oldest daughter, many people feel, should be married before the should be married first. Should be married first. Okay. Look, we don't know which daughter was promised because it says, right, that the daughter would be married to David and we we don't know. And perhaps all along it was supposed to be Mera. And look at the next verse. And Michal, Shaul's daughter, and now we understand that she is what? Daughter number two. Right? And Rav was the older one. She is the second. She loved David. And they told Shaul. And the, no, we don't know. You're right. But we're assuming that because the marriage was arranged with Merav, right? That she was the older daughter as, right? It's not, uh, it's not appropriate, right? That the younger be married before, the, right? Right. Um, and what is interesting about Pasukaf, about verse 20, Michal, Shaul's daughter, what? She loves David. She loves David, right? And why does this please Shaul? Why is he pleased about it? He got out of what? He knows he was wrong. He knows that he had made a promise and went back on his word and Merab has been married to someone else. Phew, I dodged the bullet. How? Well, daughter number two, what? She's in love with him. Okay, so maybe we can, what? Maybe I can fix this, right? But surely he didn't want to give any daughter to David. Not only that, he wants David to what? To be killed in battle. That's what he really wants. What he says, he says, okay, this is a good thing. But surely the heel of the spot should come back. Ah, okay. And Shaul said, I will give her to him and she will be a snare to him. And, and Shaul said to David, with one of two shall you be my son-in-law. <laughs> well, what? Either this one or that one, right? It again, it, it gives such a bad feeling regarding, right? His daughter is as if he's what? You know, it's a, it's a game. They're pawns, right? Right? Um, interchangeable. Very good. And right, Alexa pointed out the word mokesh. Perhaps indeed Shaul thought she will what? She'll be a spy, right? And it's interesting because we'll see in our next year with regards to Michal and when she is indeed married to David, she is constantly challenged between being what? The daughter of Shaul or the wife of David. This is this terrible place in which she is constantly, right, struggling with. 
um, it's interesting again that he says, well, right, or this one or that one, right? The daughters are almost interchangeable. When I say the word interchangeable, I'm almost catching myself because that's exactly what Lavan did. He what? He changed, literally changed one for the other, yes. didn't he? We, we don't, right. This was the older one. This was the older one, correct? He married her off first, correct. He made a better shidduch, so he thinks, right? Um, very interesting, right? And when he says, one of the two shall you be my son-in-law, right? It's interesting because when we go back to the Pasha of Yaakov, when he shows up at Lavan's doorstep and he says, give me your daughter Rachel, I will work for her for seven years. Lavan's response is, okay, better you than someone else. It almost sounds like, you know, it was his nephew for goodness sake. You know, could you get a better shidduch, right? This is Rivka, you know, okay, fine, you, someone else, right? The wording again, very similar. And Shaul commanded his servants, speak to David secretly, saying, behold, the king desires you and all his servants love you and now become the king's son-in-law. From the word chatan, don't marry the king, but be what? The chatan of the king. Why do they need to convince him? Why do they need, oh, why do they have to go secretly? I think, I think, yes. Why all this um, secret, secrecy? Why the secrecy? Yes. Okay. Uh, Sharon says, because Shaul is paranoid himself, he might think that David is equally Okay, definitely. It could be that once Merav, once Merav was married off to someone else, what did David basically do? Washed, himself, washed his hands of the entire affair. He thought, what? It's off. It doesn't relate to me anymore. Now they actually have to convince him, right? They have to go and they have to try to convince him that it's in his interest, thank you, to be the Hatan. Because um, he didn't give Miraf, and then maybe he thinks that David is now going to be boring. Like, ah, maybe he's going to rebel. He has, he has excellent, kind of very good. Not, to, you know, check on. You want you to, very good. It's true. He has the support of the people. Maybe Shaul is worried. And right. That's why I'm saying the king desires you, like trying to like, trying to woo him, him, bring him back. Him very good. Wants to keep the Keep your keep your enemies close. Thank you. Right. Keep your enemies close. Yafe. Vaidabu of De Shaul was named David at Advaimaile. Vayomo David. And a Kalab and a hair eat Hatten by Melech Vanuchi Ishrash and Fle. And the servants of David said these words in David's ears. And David said, Does becoming the king's son in law seem to you to be a light thing? For I am poor and lightly esteemed. He's actually arguing with the servants of the king, saying, What? I'm not appropriate. Leave me alone. I'm nothing. I'm hump. Okay. And Shaul's servant said to him, saying, right, went back, told Shaul, right, what David said. And Shaul said, So shall you say to David, right? It's, it's reminiscent to me of the story in, um, in Megillat Estelle where she's in the palace and Mordechai is outside and there's this Hatach who's busy, what? Running back and forth, relaying messages. Here we have the servants who are doing what? Running back and forth and relaying messages, right? This is what David said and Shaul said, so shall you say to David, the king has no desire in a dowry, but in 100 foreskins of the Philistines to avenge himself upon the king's enemies, but Shaul thought to make David fall by the hands of the Pishtun. Oh my goodness, right? If you're worried because they heard that he had said, because Shaul heard that he said, Anochi ish rash, I am poor, right? I am poor. How can I marry the princess? I have nothing what to bring to the marriage. I am but a poor shepherd. Says the king, don't worry. Now, why is that absurd? Because the king's daughter had been promised to him. He doesn't need to bring a dowry, 
right? But the whole thing has been turned on its head. Once, ah, interesting. Shouldn't it be the bride's family that brings wives? He obviously has to bring something. He has to bring something to the marriage. Otherwise, why would Yaakov have said, let me work for seven years? Why? Because he had nothing. Meaning the man has to come with something. He says, I'm very poor. I have nothing. Says Shaul, don't worry. I'm not asking for anything, right? The king has no desire. And Chafetz Lamelech Bamoha. It's interesting because you're right. Usually it's the, wife, the girl that has to bring the Moha and not the man. Different cultures, different. Okay. What does he ask of David? And this is really, it's like outrageous. What? 100, right? Plishti foreskins. What is he basically saying? He's asking for them. Asking for them. Go and kill, go and kill a hundred plishtim, avenge the king's enemies, show your what? Your loyalty to me, bring me back these foreskins, right? And then what? That's all of I ask. And then it says, what was Shaul thinking? Then David will get killed and what? I also don't have to give him what my second daughter, and he's gone, right? and, he's go and he's gone. In addition, but what about Michal and all of this? <laughs> Alexa just goes, "Oh, yeah, and they don't, don't care about her." When someone's thinking, right? It is very interesting that you're right that it's end, but Shaul's thought or what was sure that we know. Very good. Okay. And the servants told David these words, and the things pleased David to become the king's son-in-law, and the days had not, and the days had not expired. What days had not expired? What do you think? Uh, maybe, maybe. Meaning, it pleased David, he and liked, maybe there was a time. Maybe, yes, maybe there he was a time. He, he likes fighting. fighting. <laughs> he likes fighting more than getting married. Uh, this is something I can do. Uh, this, okay. Family, I can do this. Okay. Maybe, perhaps we didn't know. Okay. He did say, Avadecha, I'm your servant. Well, let's think I'm at your about. service. Because Shaul is the anointed of the saints. And in his eyes, he, he is serving. He's serving the king. The he is serving the king. He's serving the king. Okay. Perhaps there was a time element and we didn't know about it until now. Maybe they said there is there's an agreement standing and there is a certain what? Ad. I don't know, pot, 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 right? Until this specific time. And David realizes that what? The, it's, there is still time, right? Meaning the days are not expired. Come David, and David arose and he and his men went and they slew 200 men of the Plishtim. What was he asked to do? 100. What does he show his loyalty to the king? What? Double, right? Right? Uh, uh, Stein, right, and brought their foreskins and delivered them in full <laughs> um, to uh, to become the king's son-in-law. Now, what does Shaul do? Now, Shaul has no choice. He has no choice. Why? He thought that David would get killed in the process. Not only does he not get killed, what? He's doubly successful, right? He didn't just kill a hundred; he killed two hundred. Brings them back. And now he has no choice but what? To give him Michal, his daughter, as a wife. Right? That was even more proof for him to have Shemus be suffered. Yes. Vayera Shaul Vayda ki Hashem im David u Michal bat Shaul ahav kahu. And Shaul saw and knew as a result of the fact that he brought 200 plishti foreskins, right? That Hashem was with David. It's just interesting. Again, it's not part of the shiur at all. But why would he ask for foreskins? Constantly, the plishtim are referred to as arelim, the uncircumcised ones. This is the way they are differentiated from the Jewish people. And so this would be proof, right? That indeed he had killed plishtim, right? And not anyone else if he had brought the foreskins. 
And now Shaul saw that Hashem was with David and Michal, Shaul's daughter, loved him. This is now the second time in the text in which the text tells us that what? Yes, she loves yes. him. She loves him. Right? This is important. We don't have this in the Mikra. We don't have any other woman in the biblical text who expresses love. And now we have Michal, and she and the text has said about it what? Twice. Twice that she loves David. Right. Correct. 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 Um, now, what's interesting to me is, and again, I don't have an answer. I'm just going to throw this out. I wonder how much she knew him. Maybe she's in love with the idea of him. Hero. Yes. Maybe she's in love with that, right? It's a he like Gaby says, a hero worship. Here he is, right? The hero of the people. She is the princess, right? Perhaps that's what she's in love with. That's possible. It's also possible that she's in love with the idea of the shepherd who is what? Who's the hero, right? It's the story of Aladdin and the princess. It's every Disney movie ever made, for goodness sake, right? The poor, what? Ah, Yabeth. The text doesn't say anything with regard to how David feels about her. Not only that, as we kept going through the story, it's almost as if, as if David has to be convinced, right? To be uh, married. And each time it's, he is referred to as the son-in-law of the king and no reference is made to her, right? Just his association to um, to the king. Because he's modest? <laughs> Aspire to be married to the princess. Yeah, fair. okay. Um, and Shaul grew still more afraid of David, and Shaul was hostile to David um, all the days. And the princes of the Plishtim came out, and it was as often as they came out that David was more successful than all of Shaul's servants, and his name was highly esteemed. We understand that David is becoming what? More and more and more successful. And it's almost as if as David climbs, right, Shaul falls what? Into a greater David's depression, star. right? The, what? David's star is rising. Very nice. Okay. Scripture makes no mention whatsoever of the fact that David is by right entitled to Shaul's daughter. As was promised to him, the battle waged against Goliath and the Plishtim. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter. Why does the text not go back to what? To that original, what? Deal that was made. Right. And the fact that it seems that Shaul reneges on it. There seems to be no justification for the stipulation introduced by Shaul. Only be you valiant for me and fight the Lord's battle. For Shaul had already promised to give his daughter in marriage to him who kills the Plishtim. And the time had come to make good on that promise. It seems, however, that Shaul was not truly interested in giving his daughter to David. And that he did so only in hope that the hand of the Plishtim would be upon him. He had no intention at all from the very beginning of what, as soon as it, was, as it was David who was successful and David was rising up to ever, right, allow him to marry his daughter. At first, David refuses and Shaul, who from the very outset had not been eager to marry off his daughter, he exploits David's refusal to free himself from his commitment. From Shaul, he had been freed from his obligation and the story could have ended there. Except that there is another factor which changes the picture. And what is that? Michal, Shaul's daughter, loved David. And they came and told the king. And now the story changes. Meaning, he could have been rid of him. <laughs> could have been rid of him. But he finds out that Michal, what? She loves him. So now the, uh, Shaul says, how can I turn this to my, to my advantage? Right? The fact that she loves him. Of what is uh, well, it says, and they told Shaul. Ma'anyan, who, who, who told? Who told? Right. Who is they? Who, who is they, they told they Shaul? Is? Yeah, who is that? Who is they? The servants. The servants. You remember there used to be that program upstairs, downstairs. <laughs> remember. Where the servants were downstairs and the family was upstairs, and the servants knew everything that was happening in the house. Sense. No, because it would make sense if they said that now they love Michal. That's a leverage, but the fact that she loves she, him. someone had to have told the king, and I would not be surprised if it's the servants, right? Right? But every princess surely has what 
what do they call them? An entourage, a retinue. There's a word for it, right? The ladies in waiting. Thank you. That's it. The ladies in waiting. And the word gets out. And, and you know, it, it comes to the ears of Shaul. Um, it stands to reason that Michal sends emissaries to Shaul asking for David. And that once again, Shaul discerned the opportunity that he had envisioned from the beginning. Interesting that perhaps, and some of them Farshim say, she made a request of her father. She came to what? <coughs> Which is again a role reversal, but she came to ask for him, right? Daddy, daddy, you know what I want? That's what I want, that's what I want, right? He's the one that I want, right? Um, at first, um, once again, David refuses, but this time his refusal is worded differently. This time he says, right, he's not fit to marry the royal family. And also he says it's financial. He doesn't have the means to provide the king's daughter with a fitting dowry. Again, which is absurd because why would the king's daughter need a dowry, right? But okay, this is what is expected. It should be mentioned once again that there is no justification for Shaul to demand a dowry. For David had already earned the king's daughter fair and square. However, Shaul exploits David's offer in order to try already at the stage to bring harm by way of the plishtim. King Shaul's scheming fails. Not only does David pass the test, he returns with the double amount of, right, of foreskins that had been demanded, and he leaves Shaul no alternative to what? But to allow Michal to, to marry. Okay. The relationship between David and Michal is one of the most twisted and complicated in Tanakh. It begins with unprecedented love and devotion on the part of Michal and ends with frustration and the pronouncement that Shaul's daughter did not have a child until the day that she died. We'll get to that. And that's a very important um, story as well in Shmuel Bet. When we come to analyze the nature of this relationship with its ups and downs, we find that we already have an important key to understand the story as we have another story. And I already mentioned it. The story of what? Yaakov and Rachel. In both stories, the heroes are the groom. Well, I don't know if we'll call the hero, but the folk hero as in what? Gibo, Hasipu, right? So we have Yaakov and we have David and we have a father-in-law, right? And the father-in-law is Lavan and Shaul. And we have two daughters and the two, of course, right? Two sisters, an older and a younger, Leah and Rachel, Merav and Michal. In both stories, the, the only like a big difference is that we are told how the sisters in the Torah look, right? There's a description of Rachel and how beautiful she is. And regarding Leah, we know about what? Ene Leah Rakot. We know about her. We don't know anything about Merav and Michal, whether what? Whether they were beautiful. We don't know anything about them. In both stories, the father-in-law breaches an obligation that he had already given regarding the marriage of his daughter. Lavan replaces Rachel with Leah, and Shaul, who had obligated himself to give his daughter in marriage to the man who kills Goliath, gives his daughter to another man. So here, this is the, the switch or the trick. It's not that he had promised one daughter to David and then what? Gave another daughter. No, that's not it. It's that he had promised David he would marry the daughter and then what? And then the daughter is given to another man, right, to somebody else. In both, um, in both cases, the groom is asked to pay for the marriage, right? And in both cases, he pays twice the amount, right? First, Yaakov said, I will serve seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And then after Lavan replaces Rachel with Leah, what does Yaakov do? He works 14 years, another what? another seven years. And similar to our story, he was asked to bring 100 foreskins and he brings what? 200, right. The book of Shmuel relates that after David heard the conditions set for his marriage to Michal, and when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law. And we have a similar wording, velo malu hayamim, and David said, give me my, my wife for my days are fulfilled. Kimalu yamai, meaning that there is a time frame as to when the marriage needs to take place. Yaakov said, Malu yamai, right? Time is up, give me my wife. David saw that he still had time, right? The days had not yet been filled. The two stories continue also in a parallel manner. The rift between son in law and father in law continued. 
until in the end, the son-in-law runs away. Um, that is, Yaakov runs away, right? And his wife helps him and cooperates against her own father. What happens there? Rachel has stolen the trafim, right? She sits on them. She hides them from her father. And David and Sha David will run from Shaul's men and Michal will help him escape as well. In both stories, in the end, there is a, 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 a meeting between father-in-law and son-in-law. They are pursued. And in the end, the two parties reconcile swear to each other by the name of God and said God as a judge between them. In both cases, in the end, I wouldn't say there's tremendous <laughs> but there is some type of what? Reconciliation between the father-in-law and the son-in-law. Yes, also in the end. The two stories are uh, also um, in both stories um, uh, we did that. It is however precisely these parallels that highlight the main difference between the two stories. Whereas with Yaakov, scripture repeats over and over again how Yaakov loved Rachel, but you have Yaakov at Rachel, and Yaakov served seven years, and they seemed like what? Just a few days. And uh, moreover, he loved her more than he loved Leah. Regarding David, this feeling is entirely lacking. The lacking emphasized by the rare mention of the love of a woman. And Michal Shaul's daughter loved David, and we have it twice in the text. Moreover, over the course of the chapter, it becomes clear what truly stands behind David's conflict about marrying Michal. David said, does it seem to you to be a light thing to be the king's son-in-law? It pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law. It seems that the focus is not what? On her at all, right? She's a means to an end. What David wants is to be what? Related to the king and he doesn't, he doesn't seem like he does want to be. He has to be convinced. He has to be convinced. Okay. Um, this is the way the relationship between David and Michal began. It's a one-sided love on the part of Michal and consent to marry on the part of David based on the opportunity afforded to him to become the king's son-in-law. Without a doubt, this imbalance is not a good situation and we will see it becomes the problem for everything in the relationship, which happens in the future. The fact that there is not what mutual love between this couple or that we never hear that David is what? Even interested, even interested, even interested right? Right? In Michal, it seems that this is just a marriage. What? In order to allow him, right? To become close, right? To the king. What? Say this is gonna happen. You can't even say no. Like even even if he if he if he had refused to marry Michal, Michal, and she's in love with him, and the king asking, and I'm just sure that that was a good situation. Interesting, either. interesting. I, as I said, I wonder if Michal loved him or she loved the idea of him. But you also have mentioned this concept of hero worship. It could very well be that their relationship was doomed from the start because she had placed him upon a pedestal, right? And they never actually had, right, a, a real relationship, right? She, she, was, was, given to him. she was given to him. She loved him, but he didn't love her. Yes, then there is love. Correct, correct. And we will, again, we'll do Abigail because it's important to see that there, there is a relationship of love and respect um, between them. I, 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 I end the shiur feeling sorry for her. I feel for her. I think, Gaby says, don't I feel sorry for a lot of women in Tanakh? I think a lot of women in Tanakh, no, um, are, are represented as very strong women, women who speak their mind. I think most of the people, right? Most of the women are the women who speak up. And I, I truly think that she is in a terrible situation in which she's a pawn. She becomes a pawn between her father and her husband. Um, and she's almost moved, right? Back and forth. Again, what? And he doesn't love her. Again, perhaps in the ancient world, especially, I mean, in, in, um, King, when it came to governments, and we see, we'll see we see this again with Shlomo Melech as well, a thousand wives, right? Those women, most of them were political alliances, 
And so this is common in the ancient world that people married because it was, right? It was politically expedient and helpful. Doesn't make, doesn't make you feel good. Okay, stay tuned for part two. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Thank you. 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 Yes. Thank you. Yes.